Hey, fearless friends, welcome to Terror Tales, a podcast presented by the tech think tank. Get ready, where the darkness awaits. Are you prepared to let it in? Let the haunting begin. Tonight's bone chilling terror tale Murder at Bridge by Anne Austin. Chapter 20. It was Wednesday evening, four whole days since Nita Lee Selim, Broadway dancer, had been murdered while she was dummy at bridge. Plainclothesmen in pairs, day and night shifts, still guarded the lonely house in Primrose Meadows, but Dundee had taken no interest in the actual scene of the crime, since Carraway, fingerprint expert, had reported negatively upon the secret shelf between Nita's bedroom and closet and the guest closet. As far as any tangible evidence went, only Dundee's fingers had pressed upon the pivoting panel and explored the narrow shelf. The very lack of fingerprints had of course confirmed Dundee's belief that the murderer's hand had pressed upon that swinging panel, had quested in vain for the incriminating documents or letters which had been the basis of Nita's blackmail scheme, had deposited upon the shelf the gun and silencer with which the murder had been accomplished, and had later retrieved the weapon in perfect safety hand loosely wrapped in a handkerchief were protected by a glove. The hand of a cunning, careful, cold-blooded murderer, or murderess. But who? Who? Bonnie Dundee, brooding at his desk in the living room of his small apartment, reflected bitterly that he was no nearer the answer to that question than he had been an hour after Nita Selim's death. Well, my dear Watson, he addressed his caged parrot finally, what do you say? Who killed Nita Selim? The parrot stirred on his perch, thrust out his hooked beak to nip his master's prodding finger, then disdainfully turned his back. I don't blame you, Captain, Dundee chuckled. You must be as sick of that question as I am, and what a pity it ever had to be asked. If the murderer had not been so hasty, or so pressed for time that he really could not wait to listen to Nita, he would have learned from Nita herself that she had decided to be a very good girl, and had burned the papers, all because she was genuinely in love with Ralph Hammond. One comfort we have, my dear Watson, the murderer still does not know that Nita burned the papers Friday night. Sooner or later, when he believes police vigilance has been relaxed, he'll go prowling about that house. And to Captain Strong, who doesn't take the slightest stock in my theory, will go credit for the arrest. Unless... Dundee reached for a telegraph form, and again scanned the penciled message. Only that afternoon had it occurred to him to ask the telegraph company for a copy of the wire by which Dexter Sprague, according to his own story, had been summoned to Hamilton by Nita Selim. The manager had been obliging, and had looked up the message and copied it with his own hand. It was a night letter, and had been filed in Hamilton, April 24th, the third day after Nita's arrival, addressed to Dexter Sprague at a hotel in the theatrical district, New York City. The message read, Everything Jake so far, but would feel safer, you hear. Chamber of Commerce planning booster movie founding and development of Hamilton looking good. Director, why not try for job as a good excuse? All my love, Nita. Dundee laid the paper on his desk, locked his hands behind his head, and addressed the parrot again. The habit of using the bird for an audience, and as an excuse for puzzling and mulling aloud, had grown on him during the year he had owned the doughty old captain. As I was about to say, my dear Watson, Captain Strawn's boys out at the Selim house will have the chance to nab our man or woman, unless Dexter Sprague ignores my warning, pretends to have the papers himself, and tries to carry on the blackmail scheme, which he undoubtedly knew all about, and which, most probably, he encouraged Nita to undertake. A friend she had to consult me on before she decided to accept Morris Dunlop's offer. The parrot interrupted with a hoarse cat. "'Have you gone over to the enemy, Captain?' Dundee reproved the bird. "'You sound exactly like Strong when he laughed at my interpretation of this message this afternoon. "'My late chief contends, and it is just possible, of course, that he is right, "'that Nita was afraid she couldn't swing the job of organizing and directing Lois's little theater, "'and wanted Sprong here, both as lover and unofficial assistant. "'But that's a pretty thin explanation, don't you think, my dear Watson?' 
Oh, all right, laugh, damn you, but I'd feel better if Strawn had taken my advice and set a dick to trail Sprague to see that he keeps out of mischief. All this, however, gets us no nearer to answering that eternal question. Who? With a deep sigh, the troubled young special investigator reached for the timetable he had drafted from his notes made during the grisly replaying of the death hand at Bridge, and scanned it again. 520. Flora Miles, dummy. Table number one. Leaves living room to telephone. 522. Clive Hammond arrives and goes directly into solarium. 523. End of rubber at table number one. Players, Polly Beale, Janet Raymond, Lois Dunlop, Flora Miles, dummy. Polly Beale leaves living room to join Clive Hammond in the solarium. 524. Janet Raymond leaves room, says she went straight to front porch. 525. Tracy Miles parks car at curb, walks up to the house, hangs up hat in clothes closet, and, at his estimate, 527, Miles enters living room, talks with Nita, who, as dummy, has just laid down her cards at table number two. Players Karen Marshall, Penny Crane, Carolyn Drake. 528, Nita leaves the living room, goes to her bedroom to make up. 528, half. Lois Dunlop and Miles go into dining room, Miles, to make cocktails. 531, Judge Marshall enters living room, interrupts bridge game. 5.33. John C. Drake enters living room, having walked from Country Club, which he says he left at 5.10, and which is only three-quarters of a mile from the Selene house. 5.36. Karen finishes playing with him, and Dexter Sprague and Janet Raymond enter from front porch, proceeding into dining room. 5.37. Penny Crane finishes scoring, and Karen leaves room to tell Nita the score. 5.38. Karen screams upon discovering the dead body at the dressing table. Dundee laid aside the type sheet and reached for another, the typing of which was perfect since Penny's efficient fingers had manipulated the keys. When he had telephoned to the office just before 5 o'clock Monday afternoon to see if anything had come up, Dundee had learned from Penny that Peter Dunlop had issued an informal call to the crowd for a meeting at his home that evening. You're going, of course, Dundee had asked. Then, during the discussion of the case, I wish you'd try to get the answers to some questions which need clearing up, if you can do so without getting yourself in Dutch with your friends. Fine? Got a pencil? Here goes. And now he was rereading the report she had conscientiously written and left on his desk Tuesday morning. Peter, declaring he wanted to get at the bottom of this case, presided almost like a judge on the bench, and asked nearly every question you wanted the answer to. Everyone in the crowd adores gruff old Peter, and no one dreamed of resenting his barrage of questions. What a detective he would make! First, Janet admitted that she did not go directly to the front porch when she left the living room after her table finished the last rubber, went first to the hall laboratory to comb her hair and renew her makeup, said she was there alone about five minutes, then went to the front porch, revised her story after Tracy had said he did not see her on the porch when he arrived. Second, Judge Marshall said he glanced into the living room when he arrived, saw Karen, Carolyn, and me absorbed in our game, and went on down the hall to hang up his hat and stick, proceeded immediately to the living room. Third, John Drake told Peter he entered the front hall and passed on to the laboratory to wash up, felt sticky after his walk from the country club, hung up hat in the guest closet, went to living room within three minutes after reaching the house. Fourth, Polly and Clive told Peter that they stayed together in the solarium the whole time, stationed at a front window watching for Ralph. When Peter asked them if they could confirm Judge Marshall's story and Johnny Drake's story, they said they had seen them both arrive, but had paid no attention to them after they were in the house. It occurred to Peter, too, to wonder if either Polly or Clive went to Nita's room to warn her that Ralph knew about Sprague's having slept the night before in the upstairs bedroom. They both denied emphatically that they had done so. Fifth, Judge Marshall, the pompous old darling, still smarting under the insinuations you made about him and Nita right after the murder, 
volunteered the information to Peter that Nita had not paid her rent, on the plea that she was short of funds, and that he had told her to let it go until it was quite convenient. Sixth, the word blackmail was not mentioned, and Johnny Drake, because of professional ethics, I suppose, did not tell about Nita's two deposits of $5,000 each in his bank. Seventh, the secret shelf in the foyer closet was not mentioned. Peter's verdict, after he got through with us, was that only Sprague could have done it, using the gun and silencer which Nita herself had stolen from Hugo. I couldn't tell him that you are convinced that Lydia's alibi for him is a genuine one, for apparently Lydia hasn't told either Flora or Tracy that she was able to furnish Sprague an alibi. And that's all, except that Peter asked me to convey to you his apologies for his rudeness Monday afternoon. Penelope Crane with a deep sigh, Dundee laid Penny's report aside. "'And that does seem to be all, my dear Watson,' he told the parrot. "'Exactly half a dozen possible suspects, and not an atom of actual evidence against one of them, except that Judge Marshall owned the gun. Six, Count them. Judge Marshall, John Drake, Flora Miles, Clive Hammond, Polly Beale, Janet Raymond. Every single one of them a possible victim of blackmail, since the girls all attended the Forsyth School, were needed directed to Mr. Clay for two years, and since the men make several trips a year to New York. Six people, all of whom probably knew of the existence of the secret shelf. Six people who knew Nita was in her bedroom, either from having seen her go, or from hearing her powder box tinkling its damnable tune. Yes, Penny, you're right. That's all, so far as Hamilton is concerned. If Sanderson won't let me go to New York, which is where this damn business started, I'll resign and go out on my own without wasting another day here. But Dundee did not go to New York the next morning. He was far too busy in Hamilton. End of chapter 20 Hey, if you're enjoying the stories, give us a thumbs up by clicking the like button and hit subscribe to our Tech Think Tank channel. To hear more terror tales, click the pop-up banner now or follow the link in the description below. Time to get back into our terror tale. Ready for more? Let's continue the story. Chapter 21 Hello, Penny, Dundee greeted the district attorney's private secretary Thursday morning at five minutes after nine. Any news from Sanderson? Yes, Penny Crane answered listlessly. A night letter. He says his mother is still very low and that we're to wire him at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Chicago if anything turns up. Then I suppose I can reach him there by long distance. And Dundee lifted the telephone from Penny's desk to put in the call. What's happened? Penny demanded, her brown eyes wide and startled. And hurry it up, will you please? Dundee urged the long distance operator before hanging up the receiver and answering Penny's question. That's just the trouble. Nothing's happened, and nothing is very likely to happen here. I'm determined to go to New York and work on this pesky case from that end. Then you've come around to Captain Strawn's theory that it was a New York gunman? Penny asked, hopefully. Not by a jugful. But what's the matter with you this morning, young woman? You're looking less like a new Penny and more like one that has been too much in circulation. Thanks, Penny retorted sarcastically. Then she grinned wryly. You are right, as a matter of fact. I was up too late last night. Bridge at the Mileses. Bridge? Dundee ejaculated incredulously. So the bridge party did take place, in spite of the society editor's discreet announcement yesterday that owing to the tragic death of Mrs. Selim, the regular every other Wednesday dinner bridge of the Foresight Alumni Association will not be held this evening at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Tracy Miles as scheduled. It wasn't a dinner bridge, and it really wasn't intended to be a party. Penny corrected him. It just sort of happened. And of all the ghastly evenings... Tell me about it, Dundee suggested. Knowing this town's telephone service as I do, I'll have plenty of time to listen. And you don't know how all agog I am for inside gossip on Hamilton's upper crust. Idiot, Penny flung at him scornfully. You know society would bore you to death. But I don't think you would have been exactly bored last night, knowing as I do your opinion of Dexter Sprague. Sprague? Good Lord, was he there? This does promise to be interesting. Tell me all. Give me time, Penny snapped. 
I might as well talk, since there's almost no work for me to do with Bill away. Ralph called me up last night at dinner time and asked me if I felt equal to playing bridge again. He said that he, Clive, Tracy, and Johnny Drake had lunched together yesterday, as they frequently do, at the athletic club, and that Judge Marshall, who had been lunching at another table with his friend, Attorney Sampson, stopped at their table and suggested a bridge game at his home for last evening. Hugo said he wanted to coax Karen into playing again, so she would get over her hysterical aversion to the game, since she had to replay that awful death hand. You see, Penny explained, parenthetically, Hugo is a regular bridge fiend, and naturally he doesn't want to be kept out of his game. Brute, Dundee cried disgustedly. Why couldn't he give the poor girl a few days more? That's what I thought, Penny acknowledged, but I didn't get an intuition against bridge, and the idea rather appealed to me personally. The last few days haven't been particularly cheerful ones, so I told Ralph I'd be glad to go. Tracy had suggested his house instead of Hugo's, because Betty wasn't well yesterday, and Flora wouldn't want to leave her for a whole evening. Well, Ralph and I... Are you going to marry Ralph Hammond, Penny? Dundee interrupted, as if prompted by casual interest. Penny's pale face flushed vividly. No, I'm not in love with him, and I'm sure he realizes I'm not and won't ask me again. But I had to say yes Sunday. I simply couldn't let you walk in on us after I'd permitted you to eavesdrop while he was talking without first saying the one thing that would convince him that I believed in his innocence and hadn't set a trap for him. I see, Dundee acknowledged soberly, but his blue eyes shone with sudden joy. Oh, there's long distance. Just a minute, darling. Hello, hello. Yes, this is Dundee. Oh, all right. Try again in fifteen minutes, will you? He hung up the receiver and explained to Penny. Sanderson hasn't reached the hospital yet, but is expected soon. Go on with your story. Who all played bridge at the Mileses? You don't mean to say that Dexter Sprague was invited, too. Penny's face was still a brilliant pink as she answered. I refused to have my climax spoiled. When Ralph and I got there at eight, we found that Peter and Lois had dined with Tracy and Flora, and that they were delighted at the prospect of bridge, as a relief from endless discussions of the murder. We'd hardly got there when the marshals came, poor little Karen not suspecting that she was going to have to play. Then came Johnny Drake alone, with the news that Carolyn was in bed and very miserable with a summer cold. Polly walked over from her house, which is on the next hill to the right, you know. She said Clive had decided to work late at the office, and had promised to call for her about eleven to take her home. What about Janet Raymond? Was she left out? Dundee asked. I told you it wasn't a planned affair, Penny reminded him, but Flora did telephone her, and she said she didn't feel like coming. She'd been moping about like a sick cat since Nita's death. We all knew she was idiotically in love with Dexter Sprague, and it must have been an awful blow to her to hear you read aloud that note Nita received from Sprague. So I noticed, Dundee nodded, recalling the deathly pallor of the girl's face, as Sprague had glibly explained away that damning note and all its implications. Well, Penny continued, Tracy suggested bridge, and at first Karen flatly refused to play, but Hugo finally persuaded her. Karen would do absolutely anything for that ridiculous old husband of hers. I simply can't understand it. How she can be in love with him, I mean. I thought you liked Judge Marshall, Dundee laughed. Oh, I do in a way, but fancy a young girl like Karen being in love with him. Well, anyway, we all went out to the east porch, which is kept in readiness for bridge all summer. Iron bridge tables covered with oilcloth, and with oilcloth pouches for the cards and score pads, so there's never any bother about scurrying with things on account of rain. It's a rude, stone-floored porch right outside the living room, and under it are the garages, so it's high and cool, with a grand view of Mirror Lake down below, and of the city in the distance. She sighed, and Dundee knew she was thinking of her own lost home in Brentwood, the fine old colonial mansion which had been sacrificed to her father's disastrous Primrose Meadows venture. Then she went on. I don't know why I am telling you all this, except that the setting was so pleasant that we should have had a much better time than we did. You're an artful minx, Penny, Dundee chuckled. You're working up suspense for the entrance of the villain. Then let me do it justice, Penny retorted. Lois and Peter, Ralph and I, made up one table for bridge. 
Tracy and Polly, Judge Marshall, and Karen the other. Flora said she didn't want to play, because she wanted to be free to keep an eye on Betty, although she protested she had perfect faith in Lydia, who, Flora says, is proving to be a marvel with the children. And Johnny Drake asked her to play anagrams with him in between trips to the nursery. Johnny has a perfect pash for anagrams and is a wow. So Tracy got the box of anagrams out of the trophy room. The trophy room? Dundee repeated, amused. That's what Tracy calls it, Penny explained impatiently, because he has a couple of golf cups and Flora has an immense silver atrocity which testifies to the fact that she was the ladies' tennis champion of the state for one year. There are also some mounted fish and some deer heads with incredible antlers, but the room is really used as a catch-all for all the sports things. Rackets, golf clubs, skis, ping-pong table, etc. Anyway, Tracy brought out the box of anagrams, and we were all having a pretty good time when, at half-past eight, the butler announced Mr. Dexter Sprague. "'Your tone makes me wish I'd been there,' Dundee acknowledged. "'What happened?' "'You know how slap him on the back Tracy always is?' Penny asked, grinning. "'Well, you should have seen him and heard him as he dismissed poor Whitson, the butler, "'as if he were giving him notice, instead of letting him off for the night. "'And the icy dignity with which he greeted poor Sprague. "'Poor Sprague?' Dundee echoed. "'Well, after all, Sprague had been received by all the crowd before Nita's death,' Penny retorted. "'I think it was rather natural for him to think he'd still be welcome.' He began to apologize for his uninvited presence, saying he had felt lonesome and depressed and had just jumped into a taxi and come along, hoping to find the Miles's inn. Flora tried to act the lady hostess, but Peter got up from his bridge table and said in tones even icier than Tracy's, "'Will you excuse me, Flora? And will you take my place straight? I'm going into the library. I don't enjoy the society of murderers.'" "'Good Lord!' Dundee ejaculated, shocked but admiring. "'Did Sprague make a quick exit?' "'Not just then,' Penny said mysteriously. "'Of course everyone was simply stunned, but Sprague retorted cheerfully. "'Neither do I, Dunlap.' "'Peter stalked on into the living room on his way to the library. "'Johnny took his place at the bridge table, "'and Tracy, at an urgent signal from Flora, "'offered his seat at the other table to Sprague, "'as if he were making way for a leper.' Poor Polly had to be Sprague's partner. Flora, as if she were terrified at what might happen, you know how frightfully tense and nervous she is, made an excuse to run upstairs for a look at Betty. And something terrible did happen, Dundee guessed. You're looking positively ghoulish. Out with it. After about half an hour of playing without pivoting, Penny went on imperturbably, Hugo bid three spades. Karen raised him, in a trembling voice, to five spades. Hugo, of course, went to a little slam, and Dexter Sprague, if you can believe me, said, Better not leave the table, Karen. A little slam bid in spades has been known to be fatal to the dummy. No. Dundee was genuinely shocked, but before he could say more, the telephone rang. Sanderson at last. Hello, Chicago? Oh, hello, Captain Strawn. What's that? Oh, my God! Where did you say the body is? He listened for a long minute, then, with a dazed... "'Thanks. I'll be over.' He hung up the receiver. "'Sprague. Murdered.' He answered the horrified question in Penny's eyes. "'Body discovered this morning, about nine, by one of the Miles's maids. "'In what you described just now as the trophy room. "'Shot. Just below the breastbone,' Captain Strawn says. "'The trophy room?' Penny cried. "'Then that's where he was all the time after he disappeared so strangely last night.' "'Whoa, Penny,' Dundee commanded. "'Get hold of yourself. You're shaking all over. "'I want to know everything you know, as quickly and as accurately as you can tell it. "'Go right on. Poor Dexter,' Penny groaned, covering her convulsed face with her hands. "'To think that he was dead when we were saying such horrid things about him. "'Don't waste sympathy on him, honey,' Dundee cut in, his voice very gentle but urgent. "'If he had heeded my warning Monday, he wouldn't be dead now.' "'What do you mean?' Penny gasped, but she was already calmer. "'Your warning?' "'I had a strong suspicion that he was mixed up with Nita in her blackmail scheme, "'and I took the trouble to warn him not to try to carry on with it. "'Yesterday afternoon I begged Strawn to have him shadowed, to see that he kept out of mischief. "'I was afraid the temptation would be too strong for him, "'but Strawn wouldn't listen to me, 
still clinging to his theory of a New York gunman. Feeling better now, honey? Can you go on? I want to get out to the Miles house as soon as I can. You're getting very affectionate, aren't you? Penny gave him a wobbly smile in which, however, there was no reproof. I think I can go on now. Where was I? Good girl, Dundee applauded, but his heart was beating harder with something more than excitement over Sprague's murder. You'd just told me about Sprague's warning Karen not to leave the table when she became dummy after Judge Marshall's little slam bid in spades. I remember, Penny said, pressing her fingers into her temples. But Karen did leave the table. When Sprague said that awful thing, poor Karen burst into tears and ran from the porch to the living room. Hugo started to follow her, but Sprague halted him by apologizing very humbly, and then by adding, "'I'd really like to see you play this hand, sir. I believe I've got the cards to set you with.' Of course, he could not have said anything better calculated to hold Hugo, who, as I said, is a regular fiend when it comes to bridge. Well, Hugo played the hand and made his little slam, and then he again started to go look for Karen, but Polly, who was Sprague's partner, you know, told him in that brusque way of hers to go on with the game and give Karen a chance to have her little weep in peace. Probably Hugo would have gone to look for her anyway, but just then Flora came back. She said Betty was asleep at last, and that her temperature was normal, and when she heard about Karen, she offered to take her hand until Karen felt like coming back. What did Drake do then? He'd been playing anagrams with Mrs. Miles, you said, Dundee interrupted. Don't you remember? I told you that Johnny had taken Peter's place at our table after Peter refused to breathe the same air as Dexter Sprott, Penny reminded him. Ralph and I, Lois and Johnny, were playing together, and just at the time I became dummy, Sprague became dummy at the other table. He rose, saying he had to go telephone for a taxi, and passed from the porch into the living room. Where is the telephone? The one the guests use is on a table in the hall closet, where we put our things, Penny explained. You can shut the door and hold a perfectly private conversation. Well, we never saw Dexter Sprague again. Good Lord, another bridge dummy murdered, Dundee groaned. At least the newspapers will be happy. Didn't anyone go to look for him after the hand was played? Not straight off, Penny answered, with an obvious effort to remember clearly every detail. Let's see. Oh, yes, that hand was played out before Ralph had finished playing his at our table, so I was free to pay attention to the other table. Flora said that since they couldn't play another hand until Dexter came back, she thought she'd better hunt up Karen, who hadn't come back yet. How long was Mrs. Miles away from the porch? Dundee asked quickly. Oh, I don't know. Ten minutes, maybe. She came back alone, saying she had found Karen in her bedroom, Flora's room, of course, crying inconsolably. Flora told Hugo he'd better go up to her himself, since she evidently had her feelings hurt because he hadn't followed her in the first place. Tracy, who wasn't playing bridge, you remember, because he had given up his place to Sprague, asked Flora if she'd seen Sprague, and Flora said in a surprised voice, No, I wonder where he is all this time. And Polly said that probably he'd gone to the lavatory, which opens into the main hall and is next to the library. Well, pretty soon Judge Marshall and Karen came back. Pretty soon? Just how long was Judge Marshall gone? Dundee pressed her. His pencil, which had been flying to take down her every word, was poised over the notebook he had snatched from her desk. I can't say exactly, Penny protested thornily. I was playing again at the other table. I suppose it was about ten minutes, for Ralph and I had made another rubber, I remember. Anyway, Karen was smiling like a baby that has had a lot of petting, but she said Hugo had promised her she wouldn't have to play bridge any more that evening. So Flora remained at that table, playing opposite Hugo, while Tracy played with Polly. As soon as Tracy became dummy, Flora suggested he go look for Sprague. And just how long was he gone from the porch? Dundee asked. Less than no time, Penny assured him. He was back before Polly had finished playing the hand. He said he'd gone to the hall closet, where Whitson the butler would have put Sprague's hat and stick, and that he had found they were gone. Well, and you needn't put down well every time I say it, Penny interrupted herself partly. Tracy said he supposed Sprague had ordered his taxi and had decided to walk down the hill to meet it. And he added that that was exactly the kind of courtesy you could expect from a cad and a bounder like Sprague, walking in uninvited, making Karen cry, then walking out without a word, leaving the game while he was dummy. 
Flores spoke up then, and said it was no wonder Dexter had left without saying good-bye, considering how he'd been treated. Then Tracy said something ugly and sarcastic about Flores being disappointed because Sprague had not decided to spend the whole evening. A first-class row, eh? Dundee interrupted with keen interest. Rather. Flora almost cried, said Tracy knew good and well that she had only been playing up to Sprague before Nita's death, in the hope of getting the lead in the Hamilton movie, if Sprague got the job of directing it. And Tracy said, "'So you call it playing up, do you? It looked like high-powered flirting to me, or maybe it was more than a flirtation.' Then Flora told him he hadn't acted jealous at the time, and that he knew he'd have been glad if she'd got the lead. Well, just then along came Janet. "'Janet Raymond?' Dundee ejaculated. "'I thought you said she had refused the invitation when Mrs. Miles phoned her.' "'So she had, but she said she had changed her mind and had been blue all evening and needed cheering up. "'How did she get in?' "'She walked over from her house, which isn't very far from the Miles's, "'and simply came up the path to the porch,' Penny explained. "'Tracy asked her if she had seen Sprague on the road.' It's the same road Dexter would have had to take going down the hill to the main road, and she acted awfully queer. How? Dundee demanded. Exactly as she would act since she was in love with him, Penny retorted. She turned very red and asked if Sprague had inquired for her, and Flora quite sharply told her he hadn't. Then Janet said she was very much surprised that Sprague had been there, and that she couldn't understand why he had behaved so strangely. Then Lois said she might as well f go fetch Peter from the library, since Sprague was no longer there to contaminate the atmosphere. She came back. After how long a time? Oh, about five minutes, I suppose, Penny answered wearily. She came in, her arm linked with Peter's, and laughing. Said she had found him reading a Deadwood Dick thriller, one of Tracy's hobbies, she broke up to explain, is collecting old-fashioned thrillers like the Nick Carter, Diamond King Brady, Buffalo Bill, and Deadwood Dick paperbound books. Of course he didn't take up that hobby until a lot of other rich men had done it first. There was never anybody less original than poor Tracy. Well, Flora gave up her place to Janet, and again played anagrams with Johnny, Peter taking his original place at our table. Suddenly Polly threw down her cards. She'd been having rotten luck and seemed out of sorts and said she didn't want to play bridge anymore. So poor Flora again had to be the perfect hostess and switch from anagrams to bridge. And Polly played anagrams with Drake, Dundee prompted. No, she said she thought anagrams were silly, and wandered off the porch and down the path, calling over her shoulder that she was going to take a walk. Tracy asked Johnny if he'd mind mixing the highballs and bringing out the sandwiches said Whitson had left a thermos bucket of ice cubes on the sideboard, some bottles of ginger ale, and a tray of glasses and sandwiches. Told him he'd find decanters of scotch and rye, and to bring out both. So Drake left the room, too, Dundee mused. Oh, Lord, I knew I'd find that every last one of the six had a chance to kill Sprague, as well as Nita. How long was Polly Beale gone on this walk of hers? She came in with a pink water lily, said she'd been down to the lily ponds, and that Flora had enough to spare her then, Penny answered. She couldn't have been away more than ten minutes, because Johnny was just mixing the highballs, according to our preference for scotch or rye, or plain ginger ale, which both Ralph and I chose. After we'd had our drinks and the sandwiches, we went on with bridge. Polly and Johnny just wandered about the porch, or watched the game at the two tables. And about five minutes after eleven, Clive Hammond arrived coming up the path to the porch, just as Janet had. After he came, there was no more bridge, but we sat around on the porch and talked until midnight. Clive said he was too tired to play bridge, but he'd been struggling all evening with a naughty problem. "'I can sympathize with him,' Dundee said grimly as he rose. "'I've got my own naughty problem awaiting me. When that call comes through from Chicago, tell Sanderson the bad news, and say I'll telephone him later.'" Thanks for tuning in. If you liked the terror tales and got a bit scared, please give the video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And hey, don't forget to subscribe to our Tech Think Tank channel. Your support helps us find more mysterious stories to share. We shall see you in our next episode of Terror Tales. Until then, may your night be wrapped in shadows and touched by the unknown.